Many people think that you can't go wrong on getting higher-end and flagship devices, but what about the entry to middle range wireless routers? I have opened up a few of them, but I haven't yet tested the TUF AX4200, which is apparently a proper gaming-oriented Wi-Fi 6 router. But I admit that the prospect of installing Opel WRT on it was also an important decision-making factor. So I bought it from Amazon and it's less flashy than the RTX82U. Then again, we do get a single 2.5 gigabit one port, while the TUF AX6000 does have a couple of them available. And it's worth noting that these two routers do share a lot of internal components, as you will see in the teardown section. The router did go with 2x2 spatial streams for the 2.4 GHz radio and with 3x3 streams for the 5 GHz radio band. Pretty much all other features that are present on most Wi-Fi 6 ASUS routers are here as well, including OFDMA, 1024 QAM and even the support for the 160 MHz channel bandwidth. The router can also be added to an AI mesh network. But this is a gaming router, so what do gamers get? Game Boost Acceleration, Mobile Game Mode, and Open NAT. You know, the usual features that I got with some non-gaming ASUS routers as well. It makes you wonder. But not too much because I have to put this router to the test and see how it performs. While the TUF AX6000 got the recycled case of the TUF AX5400, the TUF AX4200 got a completely new design and as expected it's a very angular plastic case. There are four antennas on the rear side which cannot be removed and there are lots of openings and holes, some useful for moving the heat, others for gathering dust. At the top, Asus kept the good old array of status LEDs which is an excellent choice and there is even one LED for each LAN port. Moving forward, we see that Asus has positioned all the ports and buttons on the rear side. From the left, we get a USB 3.0 port which I suppose could be useful for data transfer followed by the WPS and the reset buttons, and then we get access to the single 2.5 gigabit one port. I suppose it does make sense if you have a higher than gigabit connection available, but I would have liked to see at least one other 2.5 gigabit LAN port as well. Unfortunately, the four LAN ports are just gigabit. Lastly, we get the power port and the power button. Oh, and before moving forward, I do need to mention that you can mount this router on the wall using the two dedicated holes from the bottom side. I had a look around the case and there should be enough ventilation holes to keep the temperature low and inside there is a thin heat spreader but not much of anything else. So essentially Asus just put the PCB into the case, punched some holes and hope for the best. I mean the router did not overheat or anything yet, so this approach or lack of kind of worked? So far it did, but who knows in the future. I already opened the Asus TUF AX4200 a few days ago, you can check the top right corner for the link, and it's not a very difficult process, there are four screws underneath the silicone fit, then the top part of the case will easily pop off after using a prying tool. Be aware that Asus was kind enough to add a scary warranty seal which I suppose you can ignore if you're in the US, but it may void the warranty if broken outside the US. After that we can see the PCB with all its components, and I have focused on the main ones. I also included a comparison table to get a better understanding of how the TUF AX4200 compares to the other wireless routers out there. I know that some people are skeptical about the use of the MediaTek platform, but I think it worked out very well for the Asus TUF AX4200. For the first set of tests, I simply used iPerf between one client and a server, and I did use three different clients, but also switched between the 80 and the 160 MHz channel bandwidth on the Wi-Fi 6 device. Also be aware that the client devices use 2x2 spatial streams. Near the router and up to 30 feet the throughput is phenomenal, outdoing some of the more expensive options out there, including some from ACES themselves. But the range is not that great using the 160 MHz channel width, which was expected. Using the 80 MHz channel bandwidth, the range was also very much impressive, especially upstream. 
I also added the signal attenuation into account since this is the only way you're going to be able to reproduce the results I got in your own home. I will get different values at 15 feet in my house when compared to your house, but if we match the signal attenuation then the throughput should be more or less the same. I have also added a longer term performance graph if you want to see how the throughput fluctuates over almost an hour. Moving forward to the 2.4 GHz network, as long as it's possible to use the 40 MHz channel bandwidth, then we get to see a very good throughput both upstream and downstream. And when compared to other wireless routers it holds its ground really well, outdoing pretty much all of those that I tested so far. Not bad at all. Now that we got to see the big numbers from the single client tests, it's time to see if the Aces Staff AX4200 can maintain a good latency while various types of traffic are being conducted on multiple client devices. I use the same ones that I usually rely on for these tests. There's a custom PC with a Wi-Fi 6E adapter, two identical Wi-Fi 6 laptops, a MacBook Pro and a Zima Board A32. And I tried as best as I could to keep the same distance from the router as when I tested the other wireless devices. You can see the signal attenuation that I recorded for each device here. Also, this is the spec list for the server computer. I used the same set of tools developed by Mr. Jim Salter and I started with a simultaneous 1080p streaming on 5 client devices. The ideal latency is 0 milliseconds but a good one should be around 20 to 30 milliseconds and I suppose even 50 milliseconds could be passable. And I see that only the Wi-Fi 6E client stayed near this value for 75% of the time, the rest raising above 100 milliseconds for at least 10% of the time. I know that some argue that anything below 100 milliseconds is acceptable, but I am very much sure you're going to see lots of buffering at that point. Moving to the 4K streaming where I set the throughput at 35 megabits per second, we can see that once again the Wi-Fi 6E client performed the best. Most of the other clients stayed below 100 milliseconds for about 90% of the time, but the Zima board did stay above it for the entire duration of the test. It's the farthest of them all, so I guess it makes sense. Next, I added the intense browsing into the mix, which means that each client device will run both the 1080p streaming and the browsing traffic. And yes, I tried to simulate it as realistically as I could, by loading 12 by 128 kilobytes of data and by injecting 500 milliseconds of jitter. And the 1080p streaming graph shows that there wasn't a huge performance hit on the clients that did good the first time, but the Wi-Fi 5 devices definitely showed an increase in latency. The rest did decently well, staying very close to 60 milliseconds for at least 90% of the time. The intense browsing graph shows that we do get a good latency response for 75% of the time, but there is a tendency to raise above 1 second for about 5 to 10% of the time. It's not terrible, but people will notice the very slight delay. As for the 4K streaming and the intense browsing, the former performed somewhat decent for 75% of the time, but only on the Wi-Fi 6 and 6E clients, the other two going above 100 milliseconds. So the suggestion is to use more modern clients and if necessary add at least one using an ethernet cable. The intense browsing was interesting because pretty much all clients stayed below 400 milliseconds for 95% of the time, while one Wi-Fi 6 client climbed above 1 second immediately. Again, acceptable, but noticeable. On the next step I included download traffic where I moved 10 megabytes files continuously and I switched things around a bit. Two clients handled the downloading, two ran 4K streaming, and one handled the intense browsing. And to my surprise, the latency was far better than expected, better than what I have seen on any other device so far. Bear in mind that I have left everything on default, so I assume Aces had some quality of service rules to keep the latency fairly in check, which is nice. We see that both downloading clients follow a very similar curve, and while I wouldn't call 400 milliseconds and above ideal latency, it's better than what I saw on other routers. The 4K streaming quickly rose above 170 milliseconds, so far from great, and the intense browsing stayed above 1 second, which is fine, but could have been better. The total throughput for the two downloading clients was 518.4 megabits per second. Next, I made sure that only one client device would download the 10 megabytes file, while two handled the 4K streaming and two the intense browsing. 
The downloading client experienced a lower latency than before, hovering between 260 and 320 milliseconds between 75 and 95% of the time. The 4K streaming clients were heavily impacted once again, both going slightly above 100 milliseconds for at least 75% of the time. Usable, sure, but far from a good experience. The intense browsing clients did fine though. The total throughput for the downloading client was 377.5 megabits per second. Afterwards, I limited the test to only three clients, one for each type of traffic I ran so far. The downloading client remained below 250 milliseconds for 90% of the time, but did have a sharp raise for 1%. The 4K streaming was handled somewhat better, although 85.4 milliseconds for 75% of the time could have been better. And the intense browsing remained below 1 second for 90% of the time, which is good. The throughput for the downloading client was 169.1 megabits per second. Next, I switched the 4K streaming for voice over IP and the downloading client would now move 1 megabyte files continuously. And it did very well. The download traffic was handled properly and the throughput was 166.6 megabits per second. Remember that I did not put a limit to how much of the bandwidth it could use. The voice over IP client device handled the simulated traffic properly as well, which is excellent. Lastly, I left all five client devices to download a 10 megabyte file continuously and this is the result. It's honestly better than expected even if not good in real life use. The total throughput was 455 megabits per second, which is way below the total available bandwidth. But this is the impact of the latency. Most ASUS routers have the ability to work with two separate interfaces for failover and fallback, so in case the main internet link fails, you quickly get to the second one. But how quick is this switch? I set up the dual one feature and after making sure that everything appeared in order, I pinged two websites and disconnected the main link. And the router failed to switch to the secondary connection. So I restarted it and tried again. This time it took about 4 to 5 seconds for the switch to happen from the main connection to the secondary one and about a second back. This means that it works, but it's not a stable system because the problem has occurred once more during my tests, when the router forgot to move to the other internet connection. I have also added the power consumption of the router as recorded by a smart relay. The mobile app design and layout is pretty much identical to what we get with all other wireless ASUS routers, with the exception of the ROG series which gets the red color palette a lot more. So we get the same status info in the middle of the screen and it's possible to check any additional mesh nodes as well as enable the mobile game mode which essentially prioritizes the phone you're using over all other clients that are connected to the network. Then you can check the devices that are connected to the network and the tips from the insights. The family section is also the same as on most other ASUS routers, where you can set a profile based on age, select the devices, set online and offline schedules and choose which type of content will be blocked. Then we get to access the settings where it's possible to enable or disable various parts of the AI protection, a feature that does not require any subscription, unlike on other brands. And under gaming, I could see the open net and the aforementioned mobile game mode. The quiet of service does let you choose which type of traffic will be prioritized and I saw that you can set up the dual one from the app. So almost all of the features have been ported on the mobile application, which is great considering most don't bother with a web-based platform. But we're still going to check it since at the moment it still offers a superior experience. Well, the interface definitely has a different design than what we got accustomed to. Now we get black and yellow to put some emphasis on the gaming factor of this wireless router. Then again, pretty much all other settings and options are the same as before. There is no support for the guest network pro, just the regular guest network. The AI protection goes far more in depth than on the app and under game boost we get a gear accelerator which I think is a fancy quality of service. The adaptive quality of service is still there and going a bit lower to the advanced settings we do get far more options than on the app. To name a few, there's the professional section under wireless and the more in-depth firewall. Under VPN there's the same support for PPTP, IPsec, OpenVPN and WireGuard as well as the VPN Fusion and InstaGuard which makes IPsec tunnels easy. And yes, there is no VLAN support as you can see. 
As the title says, I'm actually surprised by the Wi-Fi performance of this router in both single and multi-client tests on both radio bands. But I do have to admit that there are some shortcomings as well, such as the one 2.5 gigabit port, the unstable dual one, and I suppose the lack of VLAN, but then again we do get OpenWRT to expand on some of the limitations of the ACES software. So I'd say that the TUF AX4200 is one of the best values from ACES right now. That's about all for now, don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more of this type of videos. Thank you for watching and see you next time.